I just want to first give honor to Marcel and certainly to the ACLU and all of the organizations, the Black Peace Officer Association, Ron Hampton, and all of the organizations that are gathered here today to uh, address this issue. Uh, myself, as you heard, Marcel just said, I, my background is 30 years plus of U.S. Marshal Service law enforcement. But I've done it all coming out of Washington, D.C. As you know, the marshals here in Washington, D.C., we do everything similar, almost like the local PD. I mean, the Sheriff's Department, we work with guns and state organizations and drugs and everything. I'm, I myself ran a drug enforcement DEA task force, uh, had a contingency of people under me. But I'm here today because I want to, the organization I'm with now is called LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. And the mission of this organization is to pretty much to, to educate the public and to make people aware that the drug war is a failed drug war. And I'm sure everybody, how many people in here believe it's a failed drug war? I mean, I'm sure everybody in this room believes that. And, and one of the things, thank you, one of the things that we understand through that failure is there has come a lot of distrust and apprehension and, and when it comes down to law enforcement agencies. And, and I understand that, certainly because I was out there, I was a part of it, and I saw the community, and I understood it. When, when you look at the numbers, the, the, the numbers are atrocious. Uh, when you start talking about who the drug war is actually uh, targeting and who actually goes to jail. And one of the things that I had to get, and, I, and, and this one story I'm just going to tell you real quick that made me really come bring it to reality to me was when we were setting up our drug and gun interdiction task forces over in DEA. And we were targeting cities like Chicago, New York, Baltimore, Washington, D.C. We were targeting like maybe seven, eight cities, and we would do these 90-day dragnets where we try to go in and swoop down on the communities and lock up as many people as we could. So I raised the issue one day. There weren't too many African Americans that were in command, command level positions, but I was in one of those. And I raised the issue. I said, well, look, if we're going to do these dragnet operations, we're going to go in. I said, what about Potomac? You think they use drugs out of Potomac? <laughs> and it was like, and I said, and I said, what about Springfield and, and, and places like that? I was naming all of these earth because you know I'm thinking it's a, I'm thinking it's an equal enforcement, what do you call it, equal opportunity enforcement operation? And I'm like, okay, well, if we're gonna we're gonna attack drugs, let's go get them all. Let's throw them all in jail. And let's let's do this thing right. And and the, and the supervisor, special agent in charge, he pulled me off to the side. He said, Father, let me talk to you for a minute. He said, look here, man. He said, uh, he said, you know, you're right. He said, they do drugs out there. I said, I know they do. That's according to crime control statistics. They do more than we. They do more than people in the inner cities. He said to me, he said, you know what? He said, Father, you're right. He said, but guess what, man? He said, if we go out there and start locking those folks up, he said, you know what's going to happen? He said, we're going to get a phone call. He said, you know what that phone call is going to say? Shut it down. He said, and guess what? The dirt goes your overtime. And man, I'm going to tell you, that hit me like a ton of bricks. Because then I said, man, this is ethnic cleansing. I said, now you got me being a part of going into my neighborhood, going out the line because I can't go out there because they know judges, lawyers, and congressmen. I said, oh, no, that's not going to work here. But you see what, what we got to understand when I talk about this whole piece, and I'm going to I know we got to get out of here. But, but what we got to understand when we talk about the community. No, I give the community, you have a right not to trust law enforcement. I hate saying that because I spent 30 years in it. But you know what? I had to fight bigots with badges working next to me. I had to fight guys that when I said, this isn't right, you hit them 10 times, you didn't need to hit them that many times. And he said, well, Fog, why should you care? We all making money, we doing well. It wasn't your son. It wasn't your daughter. And I began to realize there was a culture in place. And what we got to understand is the reason why we're standing up here today, we're saying we don't trust the police if they go up there and say, can we search your home? How can you... How can you allow somebody to search your home when the statistics show today that we only make up 12% of the population, but we make up 80% of the drug arrest? Those who go to prison, those who are locked up. So it comes down to a time where we're saying here today as law enforcement people, no, they cannot trust us. The community can't trust us to tell you we would. I wish we could. I wish it was like Andy and Mayberry. I wish we could go into communities and tell them, can I go in and search your home? Yes, come on in. There's some drugs over there on the table. My son brought them home. I was thinking maybe about getting rid of them, but can I give them to you off the shore? Take That's Andy and Mayberry. That's not Washington, D.C., Chicago, and South. So that's not there. It's not the reality. So we are hoping, and I, I hope that with ACLU and ACORN, 
and my organization and, and all these other organizations have, that we can begin to bring the grassroots community together to say enough is enough. There is going to be real community policing. If it's not here, don't come to us with this mess. I understand Ruffin very well when he said what the police did to him. When they get behind me, and I mean carrying a badge and a gun that has stands on the back of my neck, because I don't know what they're going to do. So, I mean, it comes down to that. Listen, in closing, I just want to... Well, seldoms, they always, they turn, they turn the prayer service into me. I don't know why. <laughs> but to God be the glory. But because I guess my own case where to get this four million dollars, I went through a lot. And I wrote a poem. It was, who else do you need? Because it came down to a point in my life where I got fired on the job. I went through everything. I got evicted by U.S. Marshals. And I remember sitting out in the rain one night trying to watch all my stuff. And I remember I asked the Lord a question. I looked up and, it, and all my friends and coworkers, everybody was gone. I mean, it was, I was standing out there and I was trying to watch all my stuff. And I said, Lord, all my friends and coworkers, those I know have abandoned me. I said, it's just you and me now, God. Who else? And the Lord didn't answer me then. But a few years later when I got in the federal court and the jury was waiting to read my the verdict. Because by that time, because I had blew the whistle and I stood up, you know, all your coworkers and friends, you know, all of a sudden you got the plague, you got AIDS. and and SARS and everything else. Nobody wants to be near you. But when I was sitting in that courtroom and that jury started reading that verdict and that jury said, we find in the civil acts in the Matthew Fogg versus the mighty United States Department of Justice, we find that the U.S. Department of Justice violated your civil rights. We find that not only have they violated your civil rights, but because of your individual case, we find that the Marshal Service is a racial, hostile environment for all of us deputy United States Marshals from Los Angeles, California to Washington, D.C. And not only that, but we find that because of your case, that the Marshal Service will pay you $4 million and will return you from a supervisor inspector to a chief deputy U.S. Marshal and cover all your attorney's fees. <laughs> and we also tell you this. And as the jury was reading this verdict, I remember sitting there in the courtroom because all of those who were afraid of me and hiding and ducking and hiding around corners, they realized now my case was standing in the gap for them. And then a lot of them came over to me, but they were hiding and running. And I was standing there, and then I remember this voice came back in my mind. It said, Matthew, my son, remember that night years ago when you cried unto me and you said, Lord, all my friends and coworkers and my buddies and even my fiance left me, all of them had left me. He said, remember you said you was all by yourself? He said, well, I ask you now, who else do you need? So we're going to close out in prayer, ladies and gentlemen. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we've come here and gathered here, oh God, today uh, with organizations like ACORN and ACLU and National Black Police Officers Association, and Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, and Students Against Sensible Drug Policies, and Lord God, all of the organizations that have gathered here, the attorneys, Ruffin, and so forth, we ask that, Lord God, a special grace upon them, oh Father as they stand up for justice. Father, I pray that, oh God, no matter what they do or where they go, we pray that as we leave this meeting, that we go as a group, Lord God, not just as one, but as a group, one voice saying enough is enough. We go there, we go out and we leave this room, as we go out into the highways and byways, we're able to see, people can look at us and say, what must I do to make this a better place? So as we're about to leave this meeting, we pray that this meeting has been a, has been, a, has been an important gathering, and it, and it will make a difference as we continue to go forward. We pray and we ask you these blessings in your name. In Jesus' name, amen.